Um, without further ado, we're going to talk about optimal nutrition for brain health. So some of the objectives for this afternoon, um, we're going to talk about some inflammatory and anti-inflammatory foods um, to support um, or not support the brain. Um, we know um, when we look online, say for diet and Parkinson's disease, there's really not a whole lot of information, right? I'm sure some of you have done research of your own. Um, but what we do know is that neurodegeneration is impacted by uh, oxidative stress and inflammation. So that's a big direction that we're going to go into. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the connection between the brain and the gut. And um, lastly, talk about kind of a, a holistic, full body approach to um, treating uh, memory and cognition, uh, with nutrition being a big part of that. So before getting into food, um, oftentimes hydration gets overlooked. We talk about all these different food components, but water is really um, number one. So kind of to start off with that, the body is 70% water, and the brain is made up of 75 to 80% water. So if you think about a dehydrated brain, um, it doesn't sound good, for one. Um, but when we're dehydrated, um, that can actually decrease uh, our blood flow, and it's adequate blood flow that's necessary to get oxygen and nutrients to the brain, so water is important there. Uh, staying hydrated is also really important for detoxification, so on a daily basis we're exposed to pesticides, chemicals, all these toxins in our environment, and it's our liver and kidneys job to kind of help to detoxify the body, and they can't do that when we're dehydrated. Um, and Hydration also helps to lubricate our joints, so we might just have more aches and pains in general if we're dehydrated. Um, and another big thing also in Parkinson's is that it can impact digestion, so when we're dehydrated, it can also lead to constipation. Um, so we want to make sure that we're getting adequate hydration. Um, drinking half of our weight in ounces daily is a good goal. Um, and when we talk about hydrating foods, it doesn't mean soda or coffee or alcohol that means water maybe herbal teas and carbonated waters that aren't heavily sweetened um, another important thing um, kind of big picture um, i like this quote from michael pole and it says eat food not too much mostly plants um, if you were only left with one thing from this presentation, I hope that it would be this. It's very simple and straightforward, but it's very true. Um, when we look at um, what we call blue zone communities around the, the world, they're largely free of inflammatory diseases like heart disease and diabetes. And um, one thing that they all have in common is they, they recommend eating until you're about 80% full. So satisfied, not stuffed. Um, we know that excess calories can reduce synaptic plasticity um, and can increase oxidative stress. So um, that would be a good uh, time to work with if you don't know your personal nutrition needs to work with, say, a registered dietitian to figure out, you know, how many calories a day is adequate for you. Everybody is different with based on activity level and age and other things. So, um, in a, in, a, in a country where food is plentiful and, and when you go out to a restaurant, portion sizes are, are huge, we often uh, kind of miss that. It's easy to overeat. Um, so we know that a moderate calor caloric restriction can actually help to decrease oxidative stress um, uh, and decrease inflammation. So kind of getting into um, what we call the macronutrients, our carbs, protein, and fat. I'm going to focus on fats and carbohydrates mainly. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about healthy fats and things like this. Um, in general, we want to be consuming more of what we call unsaturated fats. So those are what we call mono and polyunsaturated fats found mostly in plant foods and fatty fish. And there's been several studies on overall like Mediterranean type diet that includes extra virgin olive oil, nuts and seeds, and the benefits on cognition. And then on the other hand, we have saturated and trans fats found in our animal foods, fried foods, processed foods that contain partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. That's a big ingredient we want to watch out for. And those ingredients in both animal and human studies have been shown to decrease cognition not to mention leading to uh, oxidized cholesterol, increasing overall cholesterol levels, 
um, promoting um, heart disease and plaque formation in our, in our arteries. So um, in general, sticking to plant sources of fats instead of animal sources of fats is a good rule of thumb. And we'll get into this a little bit, a little bit more. Um, has anybody heard of a ketogenic diet? <laughs> has anybody tried it? <laughs> has anybody had success? <laughs> so I just wanted to mention this because, um, you know, fats is a big topic these days. Uh, low fat is kind of out, high fat is kind of in. Um, there's a, a lot of questions um, around a ketogenic diet that's been used for hundreds of years to treat epilepsy in children. Um, which impacts the brain. So there's more research specifically on a ketogenic diet and say Alzheimer's. There's not very much on Parkinson's, but it, there is one study. Um, only five participants, which is very, very small, but it had some promising outcomes. Um, so they followed a ketogenic diet, and for those of you who don't know what a ketogenic diet is, sorry, it's a really high fat diet. About 60 to 90% of calories coming from fat. Um, it's really, really high. Um, and it's not a high protein diet. A lot of people get really confused with Atkins. Um, it's actually a pretty low or moderate protein diet and very, very low in carbs. Um, so scientists theorize that in a ketogenic diet, our brain is actually, it's running on ketone bodies, they're called, instead of glucose or energy. And they theorize that these ketone bodies are able to bypass the part of the brain that is impacting Parkinson's and Im impact energy metabolism in other ways. So supporting the mitochondria of our cells, which are the powerhouses of our cells that produce energy. So that's one, one theory um, of how it benefits. But um, after these five participants followed this diet for 28 days, they had an overall reduction in resting tremors and rigidity improved balance, gait, mood, and energy levels. So that's pretty profound, I think. Um, again, we need a lot, a lot more research to be able to you know, implement this more widely. But um, and if this is something that you've heard about or know somebody who's done it or are interested in doing it, I highly encourage you to work with your doctor or registered dietitian, somebody who has experience with ketogenic diets, because I personally have seen a lot of people do it really wrong. Um, it's not an excuse to eat loads of butter and bacon every single day, um, and that's what I've generally seen. Um, it's it's the, the quality of the fats that are consumed are still important. So if we go back to that previous slide, still sticking to the unsaturated fats, those plant fats, is the same principle that we should follow in a ketogenic diet. Um, and it, it can be difficult to maintain long term. Um, because it is so, such high fat and low carb. Um, but again, sometimes, if, I mean, if we're having benefits from it, the, the benefits outweigh the difficulty of following, following the diet. So, a little bit more on uh, unsaturated fats. So, like I said earlier, unsaturated fats are grouped into two categories we have monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. Um, monounsaturated, that's found in our, uh, highly in our olive oil and nuts and seeds and things like that. And we know that to be great for cholesterol levels and um, doesn't necessarily promote inflammation or, or even decrease, it's just kind of neutral. The polyunsaturated fats are made up of what we call omega-6s and omega-3s. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have, have heard of at least omega-3s. Um, and omega-6s are found in mostly our refined vegetable oils, um, and then omega-3s found in some nuts and seeds and, and mainly fish. So um, the important thing here is we want kind of an optimal ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s in the diet, and that ratio is about anywhere from a 1 to 1 ratio to a 4 to 1 ratio of <coughs> omega-6 to omega-3. And in the standard American diet, that ratio is more like a 15 to 1, or up to a 25 in 1 ratio in some people. Um, so it's kind of like a teeter-totter, really off balance. And the problem with that is, if you can kind of see on this little diagram here, um, these omega-6s actually produce more pro-inflammatory chemicals and hormones that can neg negatively impact the brain and other parts of the body. So if we don't have enough omega-3s to balance out our intake of omega-6s, our body can have a difficult time kind of fighting inflammation. 
and we can be off balance in that sense. Um, so some, some main sources of these omega-6 oils like soybean oil, corn oil, cottonseed oil, um, processed packaged foods uh, is a big one, um, but even things like salad dressings, mayonnaise, roasted nuts and seeds. Um, so you can work with a registered dietitian um, to you know, work on reading labels for these things or um, I mean just avoiding processed foods in general is great to avoid these. Um, and then boosting our intake of uh, omega-3s is also important to help with this inflammatory pathway. So um, is anybody taking um, fish oil supplements or have taken them before? Okay, awesome. So um, there is a lot of research on omega-3s in brain health. Um, our cell membranes actually are made up of omega-3 fatty acids. So it's pretty important to get adequate um, omega-3s and uh, they can support blood flow to the brain and through our, our blood-brain barrier. Um, they're important in the production of those minimally inflammatory cosinoids that are in the green here, um, and in inflammation-resolving meteors, so helping to suppress inflammation, helping our body to fight inflammation better. And uh, they've been shown to reduce cognitive decline in the elderly and slow the progression of neurodegenerative disease. So, um, Optimal intake of omega-3s um, can be difficult for brain health specifically. A supplement that's higher in DHA seems to be more effective. Um, there's so many different ones out there. Again, that's an area you can work with your practitioners to find a good fit for you. But um, generally speaking, two to three grams of combined EPA and DHA, higher in DHA, seems to be effective. So moving into carbohydrates, um, sugar and the brain. Um, even if we don't have diabetes, when we consume sugar, it raises our blood sugar levels. And that can be problematic for the brain, especially if we're doing that over and over and over again, um, all day long. Um, so a couple of these studies here um, just show the connection between fructose and uh, aging of cells. These are both animal studies. Um, and excess glucose consumption on memory and cognitive uh, deficiencies. So we know that there is a connection between excess sugar consumption and um, brain degeneration, um, even if we don't have insulin resistance or, or diabetes. So it's something we want to be mindful of. And sugar is hidden everywhere. Um, I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard of this or seen this, but this is just a few pictures of, you know, each of those little sugar cubes is about two uh, grams of sugar. Four grams of sugar is equivalent to a teaspoon, and the average American consumes about 22 teaspoons of added sugar. That's just, that's not what's in fruit or milk, it's addition, you know, in addition to that, um, a day. 22 teaspoons a day. And um, the general recommendation for men is to stay under nine teaspoons of added sugar per day, and for women under six. Even less would be would be preferred, but um, you know if we're kind of in the average there, then just getting down to nine or six, respectively, would be a, a great improvement. Um, there's some new nutrition labels out. Um, has anybody seen the new nutrition facts labels? Awesome. Um, so the one with the red circle kind of shows um, the new addition with the added uh, row for uh, added sugars. Um, so hopefully this will help people identify better added sugars in foods um, and, and make sure that we're choosing foods that don't have high amounts of added sugar. Um, if we don't see a new Nutrition Facts label, then um, it's important to look at the ingredient list and see if there are any <laughs> sneaky names for sugar kind of lurking um, that can help us also identify if, if the product has some added sugar in it. I think some of the more uncommon ones or, or maybe ones we wouldn't think would be sugar are, are things like uh, maltodextrin or um, I mean honey, I get a lot of questions about like honey and agave syrup and molasses. They still raise our blood sugar, they still do the same things that regular sugar does even though they're more natural. So even those are considered added sugars. Corn syrup, everyone's familiar with high fructose corn syrup. Um, 
So what are some overall strategies for better blood sugar control? And again, it's, this is important regardless if we have diabetes or not. We all want good blood sugar control because it's when we start to have you know, imbalanced blood sugar that can lead to more inflammation and problems even with the brain. So eating a breakfast high in quality protein and fat. When we start the day with just carbs, which again is a lot of the standard American diet, um, that puts us instantly in a fat storage mode, which for most people, they don't want. Um, and it can make you, uh, you leave you feeling fatigued, um, groggy, tired after eating, and have issues with your blood sugar throughout the rest of the day. So when we start with Protein and quality fat kind of sets us up for the rest of the day having good blood sugar control. Um, if we're if we have hypoglycemia, maybe consuming a small amount of protein every two to three hours. Um, this, you know, if you don't know if you have hypoglycemia, some symptoms might be <coughs> dizzy or lightheaded after you know not eating for a little while. Um, getting a boost always right after you eat. You know, needing that sugar to constantly give you a boost. Um, so we, we don't want too high blood sugar, we also don't want too low blood sugar, that's the hypoglycemia. Um, find out your carb tolerance and stick to it. So again, that's where you can work with a dietitian or someone to figure out your, your carb allotment, say, per, per meal and per day, to figure out um, and how, how to track that efficiently and uh, keep your blood sugar in check. Even if you don't have diabetes as well, you can always talk to your doctor about getting a, a glucometer and checking your blood sugar. I know it's maybe not fun to poke yourself and test your blood sugar, but we can all do that to make sure that our blood sugar is on, on, on track. Um, don't consume high carb foods without some fiber, fat, and or protein. So all three of those, fiber, fat, and protein, help to slow down the release of sugar into the bloodstream keeping us from having a huge blood sugar spike. So when we have a more balanced meal, that's going to be helpful to balance blood sugar. And then limit sweets and starchy foods before before bed and avoiding fruit juices, because those are pretty um, high sugar contributors. So so we looked at sugar as a, as a carbohydrate, type of carbohydrate that we want to avoid. What types of carbohydrates do we want to consume because not all carbs are bad. Um, generally speaking, we want to choose low glycemic carbs or, or high fiber carbs. It's essentially the same thing. Low glycemic, low glycemic meaning that it's going to have a low blood sugar impact. So we'll take a look in, in a sec at some high fiber foods, but in general, fiber benefits um, blood sugar management. So soluble fiber in general can help to soak up, in a sense, um, sugar and keep it from being absorbed into our bloodstream, slowing the release of, of sugar into <coughs> the blood. Um, soluble fiber can also help with lowering cholesterol. Um, and preventing constipation is a big one too. So insoluble fiber, that's our roughage, our nuts and seeds and leafy greens can help prevent constipation. Not if we're not drinking enough water though. So that's a big thing, they go hand in hand. And feeding growth of good bacteria. So when we eat a high fiber diet, that actually helps to feed the, the gut bugs in our colon and they do a lot of great things for us, which we'll take a look at in a second. So women should shoot for 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day and men 35 to 45. The average American is getting probably 10 to 15 grams of fiber per day. So this is something we can all work on, um, all of us. So here's just a list of some high fiber foods that you can use. Um, and again, you'll get these PowerPoints, so you can just use that as a reference later. I like to focus on high fiber foods that are minimally processed, so we're not talking about fiber one bars. We're talking about uh, you know whole foods. And when we're boosting fiber from whole foods in the diet, something else that we're doing, maybe without knowing it, is boosting something called phytochemicals. So phytochemicals are non-nutrients. Um, our carbs, protein, fat, vitamins, and minerals are essential nutrients. Uh, these phytochemicals are non-nutrients, not, not essential to life, but we're learning that they do a lot of really great things for us. Um, so they should be essential. Um, 
They help to reduce inflammation and oxidative, <laughs> oxidative damage. Um, we want to shoot for 9 to 13 servings of these plant foods a day. To a lot of people, that sounds like a lot. It's a lot of vegetables, um, but it's really, really beneficial for a number of reasons. Um, some tips to boost phytochemicals, um, trying new foods, aiming for one new food a week or maybe a month, and eat the rainbow. So try and get all six color categories um, on a daily basis. That's another goal um, that you can try to <coughs> implement. And once you've achieved that, try and get multiple foods from each color category on a daily basis. So if we're, for example, usually buying um, only white onions. Why don't we try, you know, red onion? Or there's such thing as purple cauliflower or purple carrots, you know? Um, so kind of venturing out, trying some different new foods, we actually get different phytochemicals from those different color foods. These phytochemicals that give foods their color and their flavor. So, um, a little more on phytochemicals. These specific ones listed is, are the ones that I found research on for crossing the blood-brain barrier and impacting inflammation in the brain. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard about um, turmeric. That's pretty popular. Um, so the, the phytochemical in turmeric called curcumin um, has been really effective in decreasing inflammation. We, when curcumin, to get optimal absorption of cur curcumin, it needs to be paired with black pepper and a fat <coughs> source. So oftentimes if you look at uh, turmeric supplements, they will list black pepper as an ingredient and that's because it helps the absorption of it. And same with a fat source, so olive oil or coconut, sometimes those are included in there as well. Um, resveratrol found in wine, everybody's heard of that one. Organosulfur compounds, so garlic, that's really great for um, also cholesterol and the immune system. And then uh, a number there at the bottom. So our leafy greens, um, green tea, citrus, soybeans, berries. So it just goes to show that um, the, the wider variety of foods that we have in the diet of these plant foods, the more of these phytochemicals and the more of these anti-inflammatory benefits that we can receive. So it really pays to have a diverse diet. Um, great choices for brain foods. Uh, again, just another resource that you guys can use uh, as a you know list. If you don't already include these foods in the diet, then maybe you can use this uh, as a guide to start. So the gut-brain connection. This is something that's really fascinating to me and there's a lot more research coming out on this. So we know now that there is a two-way communication between our gut and our brain. Um, we call that the gut-brain axis and it connects our central nervous system, which is our brain and our spinal cord, to the enteric nervous system, which branches out to our whole digestive tract. So it's really linking the emotional cognitive center of the brain with our intestinal health and mobility. And so when we say things like, I had a gut feeling, or I had butterflies in my stomach, it really um, you know, brings truth to this. So in our digestive tract, we have a, a lot of bacteria. We call them our microbiota, or our, our microbiome collectively. And uh, we call these bacteria the peacekeeper between the gut and the brain. So they actually impact the signaling and the messaging between the gut and the brain. So if we are in dysbiosis, which is an imbalance in good and, gut, good and bad bacteria, then uh, we may have decreased signaling, decreased function of either the gut and or the brain. So some of the things that these bacteria do, one, um, they act in the production, expression, and turnover of neurotransmitters. So almost all of our serotonin is actually produced in the gut. It's not even produced in the brain. So that's a new one for a lot of people. Um, protection of intestinal barriers. So I like to think that these good uh, bacteria are like the gatekeepers, kind of help, helping to keep out um, pathogens from our digestive tract. So. Um, they're keeping, um, and they're also boosting our immune system, so they play a large role in immune regulation. 
and producing bacterial metabolites such as short chain fatty acids. So we talked about high fiber diet a second ago and that fiber helps to feed the gut bacteria. The gut bacteria actually ferment the fiber and one of the byproducts is a short chain fatty acid. And these short chain fatty acids in the research have been shown to be anti-inflammatory, um, not only on the gut but also the brain. So that's pretty cool. Uh, there, there has been a, a little bit of research on this gut-brain axis in Parkinson's um, or Alzheimer's as well. So researchers have concluded mechanisms that degenerate the neurons in the brain can also degenerate the neurons in our enteric nervous system. So what's interesting is that um, in Parkinson's there's been found that the degeneration in the gut actually before in the brain or before we have symptoms of Parkinson's. There's already been gut degeneration. So sometimes people have you know constipation their whole life before or experience that before getting diagnosed. And so if you or loved ones have any GI issues, um, gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, maybe not that fun to talk about, but it's really important to get that addressed. Um, it's not necessarily normal to be living with those things. Um, there may be food sensitivities that we can investigate, doing a uh, elimination diet possibly, and figuring out what you're sensitive to, almonds. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we want to ad address all those things. Um, also, a sparse microbiota later in life is associated with both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, and then lastly, studies have linked gut peptides, which are like the chemical messengers uh, in our digestive tract, to depression, mood disorders, schizophrenia, Parkinson's, and memory loss. So there's a huge connection between the gut and the brain, and we, there's a lot of things that we can do to boost gut health. Um, one of the things that we can do without adding supplements, my motto is food first, so let's try and do all that we can to heal the body with food before adding supplements. One of the things that we can do is add some fermented foods. Yay! Um, some are listed here. I don't know um, if anybody's experimented with some of these things. A lot of people don't like them. That's okay. But uh, these are all great ones that I've listed here. Um, so consuming these fermented foods is just a great way to repopulate the gut with, with good bacteria. And after we do that, we need some prebiotics. Prebiotics are a type of fiber that are uh, especially a good food source for those good bacteria. So um, we can take probiotic supplements all day long, but if we're not eating a high fiber diet or we're not getting prebiotics, um, it, they might not be very effective. So these prebiotics, a fiber source that um, help to feed the good bacteria. A couple nutrients of concern, um, I, I could have listed probably more than this, but I just listed these two. Vitamin D is a really big one. Um, I found that over 50% of Parkinson's patients are, are deficient in vitamin D, and uh, just being here in Washington State, I think a lot of people are deficient in general. And as we age, we're not able to convert vitamin D in our skin as well, so that puts us at risk for deficiency. And vitamin D plays a role in a, a whole host of health issues. So um, that's pretty important regardless of, I say, having Parkinson's or not. Um, 40 to 60 is an optimal range. You'll see different optimal ranges depending on who you ask, but just above, above 20 is, is considered normal. So if you get your, your vitamin D level tested with your doctor, um, if you're 21, you know, they may not say anything, they, they maybe would, but just above 20 is, is considered not deficient, but that doesn't mean it's optimal. So um, oftentimes vitamin D supplementation is, is a good thing, and again, you can talk to your doctor or a dietitian to figure out a, a good dose for you, because that would be different for everybody depending on your vitamin D status. CoQ10. CoQ10 um, is a powerful antioxidant needed for energy metabolism, so it supports the mitochondria of our cells, which produce energy. Um, so acting as an antioxidant, it can help to decrease uh, oxidation, uh, oxidative stress and inflammation of tissues. And um, we can also potentially supplement with CoQ10. That's one that 
oftentimes if you're also on a statin for lowering cholesterol, um, you may benefit from, from taking the CoQ10 also. <coughs> so kind of wrapping up here, I just wanted to share with you this therapeutic, therapeutic program study that I came across and I found was pretty interesting. Um, kind of looking at, uh, again, big picture. So when we talk about making lifestyle changes and diet changes, it's not just one thing that's going to make the world of difference. It's kind of a combination of things, right? It's, it's a lot of little things that help us. So um, in this program, this study, there was 10 patients, again, small, but um, 10 patients who utilized this program and they had either memory loss associated with Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment, or subjective cognitive impairment, which um, six of the 10 had to discontinue working or were struggling with their jobs at the time of presentation and were all able to return to work or continue working with improved performance after this therapeutic program. So the main thing was their <laughs> cognition was impacting their ability to work before they started this program. Um, nine of the ten displayed improvement on cogni on, in cognition within three to six months. Um, the only one who didn't was a, a late stage Alzheimer's patient. So early Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impairment were all, all saw improvements. So the outline of this therapeutic program is seen here. Um, several of the things we touched on, some we didn't, but optimizing the diet, so minimizing those sugars, those simple carbohydrates, right? Increasing fiber and phytonutrients. We have optimizing antioxidants on there to help fight inflammation. Um, fasting 12 hours each night, including three hours before bedtime. I get that question a lot, like how many hours before bed should I, you know, finish dinner? Um, so three hours in this study was effective and fasting 12 hours from dinner until breakfast the next morning. Reducing stress, so yoga, which we did earlier, meditation, optimizing sleep, exercise, which you guys know a lot about, brain stimulation, um, gut health repair if needed. I think most of us need that. So again, probiotics, prebiotics, um, potentially addressing any food sensitivities or food allergies. Vitamin D level, getting that up, optimizing antioxidants, um, optimizing mitochondrial function, so there's that CoQ10, alpha lipoic acid is another one, and hormone balance. So not all of the participants did all of these things in this short study or small study, but they did the best that they could. And so this kind of therapeutic approach, right, optimizing whole body, um, a whole body, holistic, some people call it, approach is seeming to be more effective than just you know, say adding fish oil, right? We want to try and do as many things as we possibly can uh, to impact overall brain health and, and decreasing inflammation. So with that, thank you.